Hi, I'm Marge Charmley, and I'm from St. Paul. Welcome to Buy Cities, a program by, for, and about the Buy Plus community and our friends and allies. My co-host and co-producer, Anita Kozan, is not able to be with us today, but will be back for future episodes. We are thrilled to be filming on location at BECAUSE, the regional conference on bisexuality that is held here in the Bi Cities. And it just has met its 30th year of being in existence. So it's got longevity, which we appreciate. We, on the other hand, at Bi Cities have just finished our 20th year. So we're happy to be here and happy to be back after about a two and a half year of COVID gap. So having said all that, I am absolutely thrilled, and I mean it. We have two of the most wonderful rock stars in the bi community with us right now. And they are going to talk about some experiences they've had in Washington, D.C., talking to the Biden administration about health care policy as it relates to the bi community, and their own thoughts about where we need to go from here. So without further ado, I want to introduce Robin Oaks and Lauren Beach. You guys, between, I mean, you know, you're just above and beyond all could ever hope for to have here. And you do so much work and for so long and so sustained. And we were just in your workshop. And with all the healthcare disparities and all the hardships in the bi community, and you keep chugging along and you keep making things happen and you keep giving of your time and talents, we are so fortunate to have you. So we feel the same about you. Yes, there's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kiss, 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 kiss. <laughs> now I just got goosebumps. So <laughs> that was the point. All right, all right. We need goosebumps. So tell us about your trip to Washington, D.C., what it was all about, who was there, what you did, and also talk a little bit about what propelled you to talk to the Biden administration with the disparities and however you want to share that. So just to give a little tiny bit of background, in 2013, we had our first meeting with um, the Obama administration um, on BiPlus issues, uh -huh. and we brought a group of about 30 people to the White House, and we had a conversation. And then in 2014, we had another meeting, mm -hmm. and then in 2016, 13, 15, 16, yeah. okay, tw 13, 15 and 16. We had three meetings over over the course of the second Obama administration. And then, of course, there was the void. Yes. <laughs> now that there is you know, a new administration that is open to talking about these issues, we reached out to them and proposed another meeting. And we brought 15 uh, amazing, talented and wide ranging um, by plus experts and yes. activists and people to um, the White House for a meeting that happened on September 21st. 20, no, 21st. And that was like bi week, as I recall, right? So bi week? 20th. Yeah. And it was during bi week. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. 2022, because this will get aired over and over and yes, over. Yes, it happened yeah. in September 20th, 2022. And yeah, so that's the background. And the idea was to talk about bi plus health policy yeah um, with the administration and to hopefully bring about some good change yeah absolutely and i think you know part of the first meetings the 2013 was 30 people 2015 was about 100 and 2016 was even more than that but then of course covid happened and so we did have smaller numbers at this meeting but it made for the type of compelling conversation i think you need to have when you're demanding policy change from the federal government we did have sort of a round table type of a setup, and that's really powerful to be able to articulate what you want to say in terms of your action, and then have some dialogue with the people at the table. We did have, what would you say, about 10 to 50, yeah, 10 federal officials representing wow. different parts of the administration were there to discuss our call to action and to respond. Was this mainly in health and human services, or was it immigration, or, you know... This social security was mainly um, in HHS. We have had a meeting in the past about um, asylum. Oh, okay. But this this one was was focused on health. Okay. Yeah. And I think we did have representation, certainly from the Office of Civil Rights, and I think connections to the Department of Justice. But mostly it was you know, 
and human services agency representatives. And then also the White House um, had a representative. Cool. Yeah. How did you edify them? Tell them about, you know, what were the healthcare disparities that you pointed out? Well, we just started off by showing them some um, some data. We first of all we talked about definitions, like who we were uh, talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find um, by plus, and we talked about that we were just basically that we we're not talking about p only people who use the word bisexual, but people who occupy the space either between or beyond the gay straight binary and that people use a variety of different labels. We showed a little bit of population data about how dramatically the numbers of people identifying as bi are increasing with each succeeding generation. Mm -hmm. And then we, what did we do next? I think from there, we did talk about the disparities. So as we talked about who we are and that there are 12.5 million bisexual adults alone in this country, and that number is increasing over time. We then moved from there to the fact that we experience uh, disproportionately more health and health disparities. We went through what those numbers looked like. And then um, I think it's really important we did not leave it there. We defined a call to action for change because health disparities are a policy choice and we can make different choices when we come together by mm -hmm. us and for us. And that's really what that meeting was about. So what are some of the specifics in terms of the health disparities, you know, physical health, mental health? This is your, 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 but, but, but basically, you know, it, yeah. there's all of the data that's coming up right now is showing consistently that bi plus people have higher rates of suicidality, higher rates of many of the um, health issues that are related to stress, um, that we um, are, have lower rates of accessing certain types of medical care than straight and even gay and lesbian people. And so basically, just the data is so clear that there is a problem. Yeah, and then also a lot of, I really appreciate the big picture. A lot of, I can get into the weeds because this is what I do day to day. I can <laughs> highlight the weeds. I, I think, so a lot of what I do is um, chronic condition and health disparities focused on things like diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease. And what the data are increasingly showing is that bi plus people are disproportionately impacted by physical health condition disparities as well as mental health and substance use. And that we also see much higher rates of bi plus people reporting that they have a disability than people of other sexual orientations. And we're also, as the data sets expand in their size and we can look more in depth at the intersections of health, we see that these disparities are often heightened among um, IPOC or people of color, and especially among Black and Hispanic and Indigenous people we see who are bi plus and multiracial or experience worse health um, within the, our bi plus communities at the intersections. We also see um, disparities that are impacting in particular bisexual people who are transgender, non binary, gender non conforming, um, and we don't just see them in one area, we see them in because we think that these are driven, as Robin was getting at, with minority stress. But also, it's not just, minority stress isn't just about interpersonal level you know, issues. It's about structural choices. And it's also about stigma as what's driving, you know, stigma as a fundamental social determinant of health that leads to poor health and health disparities across the board. And that when you see people who are multiply minoritized, often impacted even more. And so we did talk about all of that with the government, especially in the areas we emphasized of uh, HIV and monkeypox, which we referred to as MPX because of the racialized nature of that term. Mm -hmm. We talked about that in depth. We also talked about intimate partner violence and the, the drastic, it's really an emergency within our community that is not that has been ignored for decades and that needs an immediate response. So we did prioritize those two areas of health in particular at this meeting. Um, and the, you know, from there we run and we said, this data has been known. <laughs> We've been coming to you for almost 10 years bringing mm -hmm. this, this data, right? Yes. Yeah, we have updates over time, but we know what the direction of the data has said and that hasn't changed. And neither has the fact that nothing is being done about it and we demand change. We had an articulated call to action with policy benchmarks that could be achieved in a one-year time frame that fell underneath all of our priorities that we had put forth for 2022. And I think that we, although in 2015, it was also we'd put forward even policy briefs, we didn't have as clear and as sharp 
of a call to action that could be done within a time bound manner mm -hmm. that we did bring in in September of twenty two. So, what is the source of the data? You know, is it somebody did a PhD dissertation uh, that had fifty subjects, or you know, what's the source of the data that is showing these disparities? Yeah, uh, so this is really where a lot of work of the academy comes in because since twenty thirteen. The government, largely with the CDC, um, has added measures of sexual orientation. And then in 2014, they, they added both sexual orientation and gender identity to the largest telephone-based health survey in the world, which is called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System data set. Okay. Over, it's typically about 460,000 individuals. That's a big sample. Per year <laughs> yeah. respond to this survey. Yeah. And so... Uh, what we and they they do ask both sexual orientation and gender identity. Of course, they ask race, ethnicity, and age, and you know you know the state where people were living at the time that they reported the data. And there you know you can see a number of axes um, that define social position, which of course with the idea of stigma as a fundamental social determinant of health, we look at uh, social position is also tied to power and how that you know minoritization, oppression versus privilege affects health. And so a lot of the data that we did cite, we purposely were drawing from large federal data sources, as well as when you're doing work within, say, here in Minnesota, where we're sitting today, yeah. you would want to look at state-level data sources, city-level data sources that would be representative of the population of people that you're talking about. And so we purposefully did draw from data sources that were higher quality. And in addition to that, um, one of the challenges with purpose is it's not like you go into a lab. They're not drawing your blood. Yeah, 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 know? yeah, yeah. But with sources like in Haines, which is another CDC-funded data set, they do. And CDC for the population is, is what? Uh, CDC is a federal um, you know, agency, a part of HHS. That Center for Disease Control. Oh, yes. Yeah. Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Yes. Uh, alphabet soup, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, the NIH, National Institutes of Health, sponsors a number of studies and cohorts. And then I also, as a researcher uh, at Northwestern University, I draw from electronic health records data systems. And I can look to see how people, what what's going on with healthcare information as a data source. I just wanted to make a comment that's super basic, but I think... It explains why it matters to ask people about their sexual orientation in this kind of research, because if you don't ask people about their sexual orientation or their gender identity, you can't answer the question, how are people in this identity group doing? Yeah. Yes, Compared yes, to yes, yes. In other identity groups. So that, I think many people don't even like, why are you even asking this? That's why you ask questions about race and questions about religion and questions about sexual orientation, because that allows you to say, how is this group doing compared to this group? Are they all having the same experience or are they having different experiences? And it's amazing what you find out when you start to uh, yeah. have the tools to answer those questions. Yeah, exactly. You put up a slide in your presentation about the funding. You know, If you could just say something about that, because we'll say more about it, but of all the, what, tens of thousands of research projects done, how many were related to LGBT? How many were by specific I mean, you know, you go on down the line, but. Yeah, I mean, Robin, I think maybe Neil and I talked a little bit about what the Visibility Impact Fund, the disparities in community funding, but maybe you want to start with that. Well, with community funding, there is an organization called LGBT Funders that cre creates reports of where funding is going to, that is addressed. And, and, um, a lot of LGBT funding goes directly, like goes to general projects. It mm -hmm. isn't targeted toward a specific subgroup, but there's one report that they release, which is just the subgroup. So how much funding goes to projects just for gay men? How many, how much funding goes to transgender people? How many, how much funding goes to lesbians? How much funding goes to intersex people? How much funding goes to bisexual people? And the one disturbing finding is that every single year that they've looked at this data, the percentage of identity specific funding that goes to LGBT people that goes to bi people is less than one percent of all identity specific funding, despite the fact that bi plus people are an estimated fifty seven point something percent. Of, the largest percentage of yeah. the queer community. So yeah. it's a real it's a real imbalance 
in, 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 in resources allocation. Yeah, and the government funding is even worse than that in terms of the disparities in, of five plus people not receiving funding in terms of health studies. Um, and when you talked about what, per, you know, there were 384 grants in fiscal year of 2018 that the National Institutes of Health funded that were what they call sexual and gender minority health, which mm -hmm. is really just LGBTQIA plus. Health, yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah. Um, and the, of those 55 even included a bisexual participant. Um, and then of those 55, there were just, I think it was seven that said that they would disaggregate date. They had a specific aim that where you would be able to tell, like, you know, they included bi people, but then what actually were the research findings about bi health? Only seven of those 55 were going to do that. And only two of them, of those seven, were really focused on bi people and bi health. And of those two, neither one of them were large scale dollars because, you know, there are different types, levels of funding that you can get with government grants. And these are some of the smallest types. And to be redundant, despite the fact that bi plus people are 57 point something percent of all LGBTQ people. Yeah. And have these enormous disparities compared to other LGBT straight people, uh, you know, and no money going for research and funding and and yeah. not even being included in the studies. Yeah, I mean, and that's and what you see again with these NIH grants, the way that that money gets given out is individual academics like myself would apply to get a grant from the NIH, and then I would have the choice to decide how to write my grant. Like, do I want to include bisexual people? Do I not want to? Do I want to include this group, that group? And if I do include them, do I want to include them in large enough numbers to be able to report on the health of this yes. particular group of people? Those are all choices that are totally driven by individual level academics uh, deciding how to run their studies. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to also have bisexual representation in the academy. Yes. And there's not a lot of that. I'm the and only. The academy is in the yeah. universities. and Right, because yeah. that's who is getting the money and who's publishing the papers. Like the data systems that are federal, like we talked about with the CDC, increasingly do ask questions about sexual orientation and gender identity. But um, people who are analyzing that data often don't analyze it in a way that you can tell anything about bisexual health because they just pool our data in with everybody else's. Who is uh, you know? Yeah, they like lesbian, aggregate it. Yeah, and bisexual are, are one group, gay and bisexual are another group. Then they often are just yeah. And because our actual outcomes, the data really is different. It means that we don't know anything about yeah the either of either population or about yeah. the experience yeah, 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 of yeah. gay men or lesbians if we yes. if we don't look at them separately. Yeah, and I think there's been change in the academy over time where more people are starting to realize just by looking at other people's papers that they have to report the information separately from especially surveys where you have 460,000 people's answer. Yeah. Who can break down the data? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That didn't used to be true. Like that, that, that didn't happen. The data set wasn't collected like that till 2014. So, and of course, Berkus has been going out for decades, Yeah, you know. Um, so now we have the capacity and I'm seeing some shifts, but in general, um, if you just leave it up to random people and you don't have this messaging out there, they're not necessarily just defaulting to doing um, best practices. And that also is why we were at the table in Washington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Which yeah. I want to kind of get back to, which is um, when we did put forward a call to action, uh, we, the central call was that we demanded that the government appoint a federal liaison to focus on bisexual health and that they would be an interagency liaison across all of health and human services and also other parts of the government um, that really would fall under the executive branch's purview. So we did ask that as our central demand. We had said that this liaison should create a working group, federal interagency bisexual working group, and that that working group should be put in charge, you know, should be charged with achieving our 10 policy benchmarks. And those policy benchmarks really focused on the need to have more resources dedicated to bisexual health, both in terms of grant funding, as well in terms of different programs, trainings, you know, that we thought shouldn't happen um, in order to be able to allow uh, responses that would address the crises that we see at hand with MPX and with IP, interpersonal violence. 
And we also demanded the HHS do a review of every agency, pull, do its internal review to see how much funding they're giving, if they have any specific um, programs or, or ways that they're addressing bisexual health in particular, because if we don't have a, we, we have specific issues, we need a specific response. Yeah. So put forward that. And we also said that they should do all of this in partnership with our communities. Good. That's yes. A big part of it was yeah. that, that it, that they be having quarterly check-ins meetings with yeah. with community representatives so that yeah. their work is actually informed by by us. And the work that you did here at Because was just trying to get that community input. And that's part of yeah. when we're thinking about this work, we're really deeply, deeply committed that the work that we do yeah. needs to come from the community. Like our, our mission, our charge comes from the community that we have a wide diversity of people at the table and that we report back yep. to the community on whatever we have done so that to keep that communication open and have it not be a little group of people working in the corner by themselves, but rather have it be an interactive. Yes, yes, transparent, direct. So we have less than four minutes. Time <laughs> flies. What are the most important things that you want our audience to know in the next three minutes and 49 seconds? Yeah. Do you want to take us off? Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> I think one thing that's really important to emphasize for the audience is that while we really spend a lot of time talking about challenges, that we can move forward together and that we can make a different future happen, but it has to be biased and for us. And that we need to make sure that we have a clear call to action that we follow up on and that we need to be holding the government accountable. I think we need to be holding other LGBT organizations accountable and most importantly, we need to invest in ourselves yeah. because we are going to be the answer to our problems, but we can't do it alone, right? But we need to invest in ourselves. We need to figure out how to be able to involve the community to come up with this platform and demand change because I think change will happen. I do believe that. Um, and I think that we're going to get there by investing in places like Visibility Impact Fund. And I think we're going to get there because we have more and more people who are going to be in positions where they can influence uh, decision making in government and in the academy and other systems of power. Um, but we, can, we can, must do this in a way where we do not leave any parts of our community behind or we have failed. Yeah, and you know, as I mentioned to the two of you, one of my biggest takeaways, and my money is going to start to go to places like the Visibility Impact Project yeah. because that's by for and about the by community. Yeah. And you know, when we send it to the LGBTQ other agencies, and they don't even give us a time of day when we go knocking on the door, it's time to uh uh let's redirect it to our community. And I think we do need to keep on on. Um working with those organizations. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't want to burn bridges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Much more, much more seriously than we have in building capacity. Yeah, in our own movement. In our own movement, because obviously just knocking on the door is not doing the work that needs to be done. It's done, it's done a little bit of change, but but we, we have to focus but you, on, on building It's capacity. a both end. Yeah, we have to do it ourselves and keep the bridges. We are down to the last minute and a half. I'm sorry, so finish up. I was going to say, I think it's a stretch to say we're working with the national LGBT organizations. We have demanded change from them for years, and the change that has been made in those organizations has been made by bisexual activists in those organizations who were subsequently fired within two years of trying to demand that change. And that is to say both that we have talented people who can make change and that Working with them, what does that mean? It also means they need to make sure that when they collaborate, it's also from the bottom up and they respect the staff and retain them. And that when we have leaders in power, that they need to feel safe actually putting forward a buy plus agenda that aligns with our call to action. So we need to support those people. Like buy plus movements need to support leaders and support the grassroots change inside those organizations. And we also need to support our own and support and invest in ourselves. Because I think yeah. working with them is a sort of a stretch when they've not put bi plus movements at the front uh, or even as a periphery of what they're doing for change within their own work. Lauren Beach, <laughs> Robin Oaks. Merge Charmily. Yes. Yes. <laughs> bi Cities. Thank you for all the work you do and continue to do and will continue to do. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for being on our show. 
Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're yeah. excited to have you. Thank Would you. you join us in our signature goodbye, yeah. which is bye for now. Bye.